Welcome everyone again to another episode of the Idea Me Show, the show that profiles the humans behind the really big ideas that are shaping our world, inspiring the future, future creators, and all for like really great stories. I'm Ira Pastor, your life sciences ambassador along for this journey. Uh, so as we continue upon the themes of healthy aging and human enhancement, you know, a principle that we've touched on uh, on previous shows, the concept of aging in place, uh, basically a concept whereby older people are able to continue to live in their homes as they age, despite changes to their health and mobility, you know, various <clears throat> smart technologies uh, and the internet of things ultimately have the ability to play really significant roles in enabling older people to do so. Uh, as the populations across the globe uh, continue to live longer and get older, uh, life expectancy is projected to increase further, and there's considerable evidence that older adults prefer to live independently at home as they age rather than in aged care facilities, uh, and their major economic benefits of supporting older adults to remain in their homes and communities as opposed to costly options of institutional care. Um, I'm really honored uh, to be joined by our guest today. Uh, Sridhar Sulur uh, has more than 25 years of experience uh, in corporate venturing, strategy, product development. Uh, he's an entrepreneur, a technologist, a business leader who specializes in robotics, mobile tech, the internet of things, artificial intelligence, all with a core interest in humanizing interactions between humans and technologies, uh, through technologies like voice and deep learning, as well as various uh, blockchain uh, technologies. Most recently, uh, Mr. Salor was the Executive Vice President and General Manager and Chief Product Engineer at the Shark Ninja Corporation, uh, where he was involved in uh, heading up product development of the Shark and Ninja brands, uh, focusing on robotics, food tech, appliances. When he was there, he led uh, software development for connected devices, Internet of Things, including cloud services and apps, and he oversaw the creation of two advanced navigation robots with artificial intelligence built into the apps, the cloud, and the robot that was known uh, as the Shark IQ robot. Uh, prior to his time there, uh, Mr. Salor was the Senior Vice President of Product Development for Xfinity Home and Internet of Things for uh, Comcast Cable Corporation here in Philadelphia, uh, which for many who don't know is America's, uh, one of the largest uh, telecommunication conglomerates in the world, second largest broadcasting and cable TV company. And there, uh, Mr. Salor led the strategic development of products for Xfinity Home business from concept to creation, including devices, services, and Internet of Things, home automation, home security. Uh, prior to Comcast, he was with Hewlett Packard, where he was the founder and general manager of the company's wearable and Internet of Things business, as well as the founder and worldwide director of Hewlett Packard's cloud and mobile printing business, known as the Mobile IoT Incubator. He helped create Engineered by HP as a sub-brand, uh, and he was involved in a variety of projects with lifestyle brands like Hugo Boss, Coach, Ferrari, Movado. Uh, over the years, Mr. Lohr has established several patents on media delivery, location-based services, cloud-connected objects. Uh, he's in the advisory board of many startups and mentored to many 500, uh, uh, top 500 companies, uh, Alchemist Enterprise Accelerator, River Virtual Reality Incubator. Uh, Mr. Lohr holds a, an MBA from Boston University University uh, and degrees in uh, engineering, electrical engineering from the National Institute of Technology in India. Uh, all that being said, Sri Salur, thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come on the show today. I'm very happy to be on the show. Looking forward to this discussion, mate. Absolutely. Absolutely. Appreciate you being here. Um, Sri, for the beginning of the show, I'd like to just really hand things over to you for several minutes. Just uh, if you could talk about yourself, uh, first and foremost, uh, a little bit about your background, you know, where you grew up, how you got interested in tech. And if you can just take us a little bit on the, the sort of the last 25 years of journey and how you sort of arrived at the upper echelon of uh, some of the largest tech companies in the world. Uh, I would love to hear that part of the story. You know, First of all, uh, uh, there are many people, you know, who have done this and there are many of them who have done this amazingly well. Uh, having said that, look, I, I've, I've been a product builder since I was a, a kid. Uh, my mother was an engineer and uh, she built satellites. So mm. I've, I've not even accomplished what my mom has done so far. So. Uh, <laughs> Oh, to my mom. Um, went to an engineering school back in India. Uh, 
and uh, you know work in uh, Sanyo research uh, for um, a couple of years. Uh, but then very early on, I realized that if I'm not able to bring a product to market in eight to ten months, uh, you know you miss the window of opportunity. Mm. Right, you know, it, there needs to be that sense of urgency. There needs to be progress over perfection, um, and and move the needle every hour, every day, every month. But know where you want to go, you know, in three years and five years. But every day, if you're not moving one step towards a goal, you're not being productive. You know, so that was deeply ingrained. And coming from a country where the population at that point in time was you know, close to a billion. And you have so many engineering education institutions, it's almost like a factory. So you have to work harder than everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, so having the blue collared work ethic, you know, where look, you know, you don't have to be a genius, but if you do things consistently and work hard from, we are in the morning to late, you can actually get things done. You know, it, it, it's very simple. So having that work ethic, you know, having that sense of urgency and the passion to build things uh, was deeply great. So since then, you know, I've worked on products like, you know, uh, Ara, do you remember one of the first search engines called mm -hmm. AltaVista? Sure. So I've worked on, you know, AltaVista. Uh, AltaVista was a part of digital, which was DEC. Digital Equipment Corporation. Yep. So yep. I, I worked at DEC, uh, a phenomenal company, uh, which gave me the spread of products for me to learn, um, you know, from the networking products. So I, I was a guy who built very big networks, uh, ATM networks. When I say ATM, not the automatic telemachine, but asynchronous transfer mode, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the backbone technologies for voice over IP network, for some of the largest carriers in the world. You know, those days, uh, I think Verizon was called like, you know, Bell Atlantic 9X, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, so uh, that was uh, the initial part of my life. And then I went to business school uh, and a switch kind of flipped in my life. Uh, right after business school, I moved on to a team uh, of corporate venturers, you know, people sure. who build startups within big, big companies. Uh, I moved from the United States to uh, Europe in London and basically managed uh, corporate venturing, which was really interesting uh, because there was a series of startups and I was responsible for maintaining the infrastructure, but I was also an entrepreneur in residence to build you know, some of those startups. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And looking at everything that you do as a portfolio of incubations, you know, in, in a portfolio of incubations, out of let's say uh, 10 uh, startups that you have, maybe seven or eight may fail, one might value in mediocrity, and mm -hmm. one might do extremely well. Oh, yeah. And I was very thankful that, you know, I had great mentors, great friends in the industry. And one of my incubations called CloudPrint uh, was able to achieve critical mass. Nice. And uh, CloudPrint is your ability to print from mobile. And uh, that became a big thing for HP. So digital was bought by Compaq, Compaq was bought by HP. So I was now working in a big company. Mm -hmm. And I moved back to the States because printing headquarters for HP is based on the West Coast. You know, it's between mm -hmm. Boise, mm -hmm. Idaho, it's Vancouver, Washington, and San Diego. Um, so I comfortably hung out around Portland, Oregon uh, as a place to um, work on CloudPrint. CloudPrint has many instantiation, you know, it eventually became the mobile print platform for the company. Yeah. Uh, but there are some really good stories there because during that time frame, we went through two recessions, you know, right. the dot-com bust and the products that came out of dot-com bust. Um, and then we went through the 2008, 2007 to 9 recession and uh, how 
we enable printing from the cloud. You know, that's why cloud print became very big. You know, it was serendipitous. It, it was just the right thing at the right time. Mm -hmm. uh, and right after that, I had to liberate myself from the tyranny of printing. You can only be in printing for so long. You, know? <laughs> sure. you can't be intoxicated by ink uh, for all your life. Some people can do that, but not me. Uh, I took the cloud instantiation of the platform. And what I realized very early on is if there is a disruption that's coming and if you have a product or a service that helps some of the incumbents who are being disrupted it's mm -hmm. a great business right. to give you an example in, two, in 2007 and 8 printing was going down the tubes and we needed a way to like stimulate printing and we said how about we enable printing from mobile because mobile was going up mm -hmm. and mobile print became big in 2013, the same thing happened. Everyone knew that Apple was coming out with a smartwatch and there were a bunch of incumbents. And we were like, how about we help some of the incumbents like, you know, Movado who had brands like Hugo Boss, Juicy Couture, Ferrari, Coach, and all those watches, the Swiss watch companies, uh, an Indian watch company like Titan. We knew that there are incumbents and Apple, you know, can disrupt incumbents in one swoop. So we said, how about we create a platform to help them? Very few people know this, you know, HP entered the smartwatch business without being the brand and engineered by HP was born. And I'm very happy to say that, look, I didn't know anything about watches. <laughs> Neither did I know anything about printing. And if you are an entrepreneur, if you have the ability to learn, put in the hours, have a sense of urgency, have an amazing focus on the consumer, you can literally build anything. Mm -hmm. So we ended up building watches for a couple of years, then Comcast came calling. And you know that part of the story being close to Philly. Oh, yeah. and, and we built the home security, home automation um, business, uh, basically accelerating Xfinity Home. And then, we knew that physical and digital was coming together. We had Xfinity Home focusing on physical security, but then look, when your kid comes to you and says, dad, I wanna go out, your question is where and with whom? That's in the physical world. Don't you wanna know what your kids are doing in the digital world? So physical security and digital security goes hand in hand. And so we built a product called X5, Xfinity X5, sure. to get both physical and digital together. Very unique position for the company. And you know how Xfinity X5 has done now available to all the gigabit, you know, customers. And uh, that is where the nexus of physical and digital started to come together. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about humanizing interactions. At the same time, you know, Shark Ninja came calling and um, you know, I, I got recruited as their chief product officer. And the biggest problem to solve there was robotics because Shark did amazing vacuums, amazing. You know, mm -hmm. they're five-star products. Go look, look them up. And the Ninja blenders, literally unbreakable. You know, amazing products there. But on the robotic side, you know. There was help that was needed to bring the first advanced navigation robot, a robot that can basically clean in Conroe's, you know, can do the mapping. And, you know, I went in there uh, and I can, I can very easily say uh, in a very short period of time, we brought a phenomenal advanced navigation robot, you know, mm -hmm. 47 million lines of code. You know, it's got cloud connectivity. Uh, it's got cloud to cloud interfaces, you know, working with Amazon Alexa, Google Home, um, and, uh, you know, uh, and go look it up on Amazon in terms mm -hmm. of consumer satisfaction and, oh, yeah. and very one. high rate of sale. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that's uh, something that, you know, we brought into uh, market in a very, very short period of time. And uh, here we are talking. Um, so a lot of products, uh, I can give you a spectacular array of products from, you know, AltaVista, firewall, search engine, uh, network routers and gateways mm -hmm. and switches, uh, building very large networks, building one of the biggest 
uh, IoT platforms early on on connecting printers to the web mm -hmm. uh, with cloud print, uh, building consumer products, connected consumer products, wherein uh, like, like watches and fashion tech products, um, uh, and then Xfinity Home with like you know cameras and home hubs and uh, you know connecting you know thermostat locks mm -hmm. and building an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Uh, bringing digital and physical security together, um, and and then of course you know an array of products on uh, you know food tech and, uh, and 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 robotics. So mm -hmm. um, I'm just a product builder, mate. I just build products. And you, you've done an amazing an amazing job of it. And I'm very you know as I'm very familiar being here in Philadelphia with many of these these products and services. I have my my shark downstairs. So yeah, I, a lot of what you've done has definitely permeated my life. Um, take us, if you would, uh, on and, and I you know I apologize. This is a simplistic question because we'll get a little more detailed when we get in sort of the discussions on health and elder care, but. Internet of Things, you know, when I, you know, I look at the definition of it and it has sort of this tech, uh, you know, the, this interrelated computing devices uh, with unique identifiers and so forth and so on. Uh, obviously, in the consumer market, as, as you've highlighted, we, uh, we have our Alexas and our uh, smartwatch and our thermostats and so forth. Bring us a little more, if you would, a few minutes into the principle of the smart home. Um, in S, you know, I... I, I'm a, I'm a, I, I was born in the 1960s. I'm, I'm a sort of a child of the, the 1970s. And, you know, one of my favorite cartoons back in the day, of course, was the Jetsons, right? Sort of the epitome of, of what the smart home would look like uh, in the future. Um, where, where are we going with some of this? Because it, clearly you have uh, created um, the tools, the software, the, these various components that, you know, as we, are, are, that allow for that future to be happening and we see pieces of it. I don't have a robot walking around my house yet, but talk a little bit more about the smart home and sort of where you see we are in 2020 and where we're going with this 2030 and so forth. Yeah, let, let me share something on, you know, on my Please. screen and you know, I'll, I'll give you the context. Um, uh, hope, hopefully you can see my screen. Yep. Um, and uh, on, on my screen, I'm, I'm gonna quickly share, um a, a, a presentation um and, and and i'm gonna just share one slide you know hopefully you can see this yep uh let me know if you can see the slide perfect all right so where we are is is, is very simple look here we are in um the, this is around you know year 2000 mm -hmm. okay right and uh, this is, I would say, 2008. And, um, you know, this is somewhere here is 2020. You know? Okay. You know, that, that's, that's where we are. So, of course, we had the internet. We had a lot of devices connected to the internet. Um, and that accelerated with broadband. You know, you being sure. in Philly, again, Comcast, of, you know, broadband being such a big business. Um, in 2000, we had close to around, you know, the era of internet was 300 million devices connected to the internet. You know, you had the Intels and the Microsofts and laptops. Mm -hmm. There were no tablets. You know, mobile was just the, the era of Nokia and Motorola. Do you remember those days, mate? Sure. So, sure. yeah. So, look. The edge and the cloud were kind of like equal citizens. You know, you, you had the Intel processors on the laptop, very similar kind of processors in the data centers. You know, I shouldn't use the word cloud. You know, I would call them data centers, right? Uh, that was the era of the internet. But we had started to see that the world was moving away from brick and mortar to e-commerce, right? It, it, it was the start of the dot com, you know, the Amazons taking off. Mm -hmm. and now we we started to see you know some of the companies going through this gut wrenching transformation. We also went through an era of recession there, right, which is sure. super interesting. So if the thing that you want to take away in every era is like the number of devices connected to the internet, if mm -hmm. the edge and the cloud in terms of where is the power structure between the edge and the cloud here, they are one among the equals mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then 
what are the enabling technologies, you know, content going to the web, you know, Netflix started to take off there, uh, commerce started to take off, uh, broadband, you know, we went from, do you remember the good old sounds of the modem? Sure. Uh, yeah, internet connecting, you know, modem connecting to the internet. So we went to broadband, life was good. And then you go into the second era, you know, and you know, the funny part of the second era is, um, again, 2008 was an economic recession, 2007 to nine, you know, triggered by something else. But then what you want to focus on is there was a 10x increase in devices connected to the internet. Mm. We went from 300 million to 3 billion mm. you know, devices connected to the internet, mostly smartphones. Look at what happened to the, you know, Microsoft's market share in mobile devices went down. Intel's market share in you know, devices, they went from like 90% of the devices connected to the internet to like less than 5%, mm -hmm. you know, it was all ARM as a chipset. Yep. What took prominence is cloud became a more prominent component. Sure. So even with printing, to give you an example, we had a print driver on every laptop, cloud print, the print driver was hosted in the cloud. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the movement went from being equal citizens to like, look, everything went into the cloud, right? right? So the era of mobile social cloud started to become such a big thing. And that is the era of mobile. Here we are, you know, 12 years later, mm -hmm. and we are looking at close to around, you know, 30 devices, 30 billion devices, you know, this shouldn't be 300 billion. I'm talking about 30 billion devices connected mm. to the internet. And that is a 10x increase, yep. right? So again, you're seeing a 10x increase. And, uh, and then you're seeing a power shift. You're seeing the intelligence moving to the edge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're seeing an acceleration of cloud adoption. But the power, there's a, there's a power that's moving to the edge. You're talking about an intelligent edge now. Uh, robots, think about it you know, out, out of the 47 million lines of code that we had on our robots, 35 to 36 million was on the robot, mm. right? The rest of it, you know, five, you know, four million was on the app and things like that. The rest mm -hmm. was in the, the rest of it was in the cloud. Mm. So the edge becomes more and more prominent and powerful. So there's one other observation. Sure. You had, mobile social cloud, now you're seeing an era of AI okay. being very, very prominent. That means your interactions with your devices, the man-machine interactions are becoming more and more natural. My mother-in-law, who is pushing 70, when she visited us, she would basically speak to my smart speaker to find what the weather was. <laughs> it was not an unnatural thing. Mm. And the smart speaker understood her South Indian accent. Mm. So the man machine interface has artificial intelligence that's been laced into it. And I won't go into the details unless you want to. And then ambient interfaces. Like it's socially acceptable to like talk to a speaker, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, we. We'll, we are moving from a world where things are being done by you to done for you. So the era of sure. robotics is here to stay. Yep. Uh, you know, you will see robotics permeating from everything from distribution centers, logistics, surgical robotics, robotics in ICU. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, of course, home cleaning robots uh, on both on consumer and on the industrial side, industrial robotics being much, much, much bigger than, you know, consumer robotics. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. the key takeaway is you're moving from an era of glass slabs okay. with laptops yep. and tablets and mobile phones connecting to the internet to what we call as the era of enchanted objects. Okay. Where objects connect to the internet, but they are intelligent. You're moving from seemingly intelligent to like intelligent edge objects. So the era of IoT is nothing but the era of enchanted objects. And I have to say, the enchanted objects definition is not mine. It was, it was coined by, you know, 
uh, a famous person from MIT, and okay. I'm just merely using it. So yeah, it's a cool summary it's a cool is, term. <laughs> yeah, so the era of IoT, three-letter acronyms are a wee bit boring me. So you move from the era of glass labs to the era of enchanted objects. And if you always see, right, this transition happen during in and around times of economic recession or depression, the mm -hmm. 10x connectivity, the acceleration that happens. Yeah. And that's why e-learning is taking off, you yeah. know, education tech, the things that are going to take off. Um, and uh, you'll also see institutions going through a massive shift as you go through each of these portals, you know, look at these, you know, economic recessions here as portals, right. which will accelerate all the previous generation technologies. Does that help? Oh, beautiful, beautiful. It's a, I, and and I, I really appreciate the, uh, the lesson and it really uh, puts in perspective. I, you know, I, I, I was unaware of that number in terms of you know, well, how many we had connected nowadays, but this, this principle of uh, sort of the intelligence and um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really um, a nice overview of, of what's to come. Um, now, now you, you mentioned um, medical, and I'd like to, you know, obviously, you know, you, you, you haven't spent too much time uh, in, in the medical industry, but I'm sure you obviously interface with a lot of, have interfaced with a lot of clients and so forth uh, in this sphere. And I was wondering now if you could take us a bit down uh, the path of, you know, I, I see it called sort of the internet medical of medical things, uh, smart healthcare. Uh, obviously, you know people are you know, have been monitored at home via some type of uh, system in the past. But we're you know now we're talking. We read about you know cochlear implants uh, that can transmit uh, data, uh, things that can monitor seizures, and I mean really, you know once again uh, this sort of the, the merging of. Uh, healthcare and sort of this intelligence on the edge. <laughs> um, take us a little bit, if you would, into uh, what you see as the vision of uh, what we'll broadly call human enhancement, um, but also, you know, we also did the sub theme on the show of aging and sort of this principle of uh, turning our smart home into sort of this, uh, for, for the elderly, let's say a, a home, a, a care home, a smart care home for, for a population of one. Yeah. So um, not in any order, it's, it's very straightforward that caring for people at home, I'm not talking about critical care, sure. but managing aging in place at home is less expensive yep. than basically uh, being hospitalized, you know, hospital to home is, is something we don't need any business case for that. You know, you are very much aware of it. Sure. We live in a capitalistic society. Uh, one of the core drivers for anything to happen is, you know, people need to make sure that it's economically viable. So number one is, yes, it is, you know, much more economical. It's the right thing to do. Yep. People feel comfortable in their own homes. Uh, and now what you need to do is enable and empower caregivers to get access to the right information mm -hmm. on, you know, it's like I am there, right? Uh, like very similar to being there right next to that person. Yep. Thankfully for us, the bandwidth is not an issue. The reliability of connection to home is mostly not an issue un unless you have catastrophic events like you know hurricanes and things like that. So it's 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 mostly there. And you have sensors that thanks to all the effort by the home security providers and you know door sensor, window sensor, motion sensors, mm -hmm. cameras uh, in, in the right locations, they are all there. Sure. Let's also look at people being comfortable with sensors on the home. There used to be a time when people are like, yeah, you know what, you know, cameras at home, no, no not happening. And, and then slowly it was like, okay, I'm gonna put cameras outside the home, you mm -hmm. know, for me, for some elements. The next thing is like, you know what, I would like to put a pet camera and you know, I, I wanna like give out pet my dogs, you know, that's, that's okay. Mm -hmm. And slowly what has happened is consumers 
have slowly come around to new reality yep. of letting other people monitor you know what's happening in their homes we started with digital security for your home xfinity x5 is a great example for digital security right we are in this place where people are comfortable with sharing their data mm -hmm. we are also in a place where in spite of all the security hacks we have gone through the travels of time in the last 10 years or so that we know about data security you know we, we saw what happened with equifax you know we have learned our lessons even our hacker community with defcon you know they have come into a place where they basically give companies that have shipped you know a lot of products like 45 days 50 days you know they hack into it they come in and say look you have 45 days fix this otherwise we're going to present a paper at defcon the summary is things are getting more and more secure people mm -hmm. are getting comfortable with sharing their data sensors have got reliable internet access is more reliable so you have a basic infrastructure for aging in place we all know about you know healthcare in the us has not changed significantly in a very long period of time it's all it's not preventive care you know it, it's like okay i'm not feeling well you know, I go to my PCP and then, you know, I get some medicines, I come back home and then if I don't get well, you know, that, that thing has not changed at all. Now, we were flirting with telemedicine. We were flirting with, hey, you know what? There are so many doctors available in Canada or in California who can actually like treat me from afar. We have broken down those barriers with COVID-19, oh, yeah. a doctor in California could now fly, jump on a plane and go to New York to like help a patient in New York. That's happened. So all the doctors that my family has been involved with, you know, my son's, you know, pediatrician, mm -hmm. um, you know, the two PCPs, mm -hmm. we all use Medici, an app right now. Sure. And, and if you go and like, look through medici as an app you have doctors they say consultation 40 dollars 40 dollars an hour insurance is accepting this so it's it's very interesting if i have you know a thermo a thermometer at home and let's say this you know uh, anything to monitor my blood pressure i mm -hmm. can give my vitals oh wait a minute that can be connected to and i can give doctors the access to that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we are moving from a world where we can absolutely transform healthcare. Oh yeah. You know, there is a book called The Patient Will See You Now. Yep. I think, you know, in some ways, the wake up call with this COVID-19 is going to transform healthcare. And technology is going to be the driver of it. Mm -hmm. In terms of reliability, in terms of security, the foundation exists. Oh, yeah. And the regulatory inertia has been shaken with the pandemic that we are going through. Exactly. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to this new era, you know, wherein uh, it's going to be more accessible. Healthcare is going to be more accessible to more people. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think, you know, instead of seeing 4X, you know, I think doctors can see, you know, 40X. Yep. Yeah, you amazing. know, the, the waiting rooms, think about it this way, you know, how much, how much time and resources <laughs> are wasted and how infections are transmitted in those waiting rooms. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So uh, I'm really looking forward to this. So summary, we have the basics, we have the sensors, there's technology, uh, the regulatory world has been shaken with uh, where we are today. And uh, we are absolutely moving to a new era in healthcare. You know, 
before we get sort of a wrap up uh, question, I, I, one other thing I wanted to ask you about, because, you know, listening to you and, you know, going into sort of everything you've done, you know, you sort of, you've been involved in creating the future throughout your career um, and, and doing many things that obviously back then sounded like science fiction and then became reality and you kept create, going on. Um, I, I want to ask you just a science fiction-ish question because, you know, something that we, you know, occasionally touch on on this show is this theme of transhumanism, sort of this uh, Ray Kurzweilian uh, future sometime from now where man and machine will sort of become uh, one or, you know, it, there'll be a gray zone that uh, it becomes kind of blurry. Um, I'd love to get your top line on uh, transhumanism, uh, if you would, sort of where you think things are going in that context about sort of the machine-human interface. Um, and then maybe if you could say a few words about the little uh, uh, warning from Elon Musk and Bill Gates and Stephen Hawking and so forth from a few years ago about AI and just give us your top level on, on why you don't think, you know, we're going to be in the Terminator situation anytime soon. Yeah, so uh, let me answer you know your your question the first question on you know, the the transition on, on on where we are going sure uh again i'm going to share something you know Please. very very quickly Please do. and um and hopefully you can see my screen here yep you know so i'm looking at computing right on top and they're moving from centralized to decentralized. You know, that's something that we spoke. Sure. In terms of experiences, we said we are going from, you know, sentiment to sentience, right? With artificial intelligence, right? You know, so it becomes natural uh, for you to communicate with machines, you know, people to people to like, you know, people to machine interface, you know, that's, that's, that's happening. And we're also moving from a world where we had discrete robotics to integrated robotics, for example, the vacuum cleaners at home, basically communicating with each other so that you, you can have a vacuum cleaner that basically uh, uh, you know, sucks up all the dust. And then you have a mopping robot that goes after, right? Because mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. move the dust and then it's like a mopping robot. Um, and, and share maps and things like that. You, you're seeing that happening right now. So right. robot to robot, also with drones. You had a single drone, then you have multiple drones. You, you've seen, uh, the opening ceremony of like Beijing Olympics, you know, it was like a swamp of drones, like, you know, working with each other. Yep. If you go back between the last recession and now, right, 2008 and now, mm -hmm. there was a rise of meditation, holistic medicine, organic, organic, non-GMO, whatever you want to call it, whether you're a believer or not, you know, we'll keep that for another day. But you are moving from organic. You know, the whole world was like, you know, let, let's focus on organic, local, farm sure. fresh. But somewhere in there, we're like, you know what? Artificial pancreas, something that, you know, connected devices yep. started to come in. Um, you're seeing that, you know, in, in multiple places, right? You know, your pacemakers, you have valves that are 3D printed mm -hmm. that did not, you didn't grow up with it but it was implanted in you. Sure. And, and, and that is happening. Look, I think the next shift, you know, I, and you have not seen these slides. I, I highlighted this. We are moving from organic to like bionic, ah. slowly. That's happening because everybody wants to live longer. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know if many people would come in and say, look, you know what, I'm done. You know, it's over. Um, the point is, it, enhancing human life, mm -hmm. uh, enriching human life and living longer so that, you know, you can live healthier yep. or, or managing a chronic condition. Uh, that's natural. And uh, so for that to happen, you will start to see things being embedded into humans. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that's happening. So in, in 10 years from now, in 12 years from now, when someone says, I have a chip on my shoulder, it's not particularly a bad thing, mate. Mm -hmm. So the world is moving in that direction. Right. Now, a word of caution on what happens with artificial intelligence Please. is, look, 
in one of my early slides, I didn't go into the details, but you know, I highlighted an error called the hangover error. Yep. Hangover error is when things are not fully baked, you see security attacks. I'll give you an example of a hangover error from a technology perspective. Remember those early days when you would go access a website from your you know, mobile device and the website would look really wonky, yep. like yep. You know, not, not really good, not formatted, mm -hmm. because you didn't have a mobile first. There was right. no content transformation that was happening on default. Sure. I can give you several examples of hangover era when we move from the era of mobile to the, the, the era of enchanted objects, where you take things that were prevalent in the previous era and blatantly apply with the devices of the new era. So even now with artificial intelligence, there are so many potential security issues. For example, uh, you have what are called insertion attacks, wherein you can prick a camera in an autonomous driving vehicle. You know, if it's a stop sign, it can, you can make it look like it's a 40 mile zone by just putting a sticker. Mm -hmm. So there are going to be attacks, you know, associated with anomaly detection, where you depend on the fundamental building blocks of seeing patterns in space and confusing the machine or basically confusing the system when it's trying to see patterns in time. Hmm. So those things are bound to happen. We also saw what happened to the Microsoft Twitter bot, you know, which basically you know, went rogue on all of us. Mm -hmm. So that's the part of a hangover era. And I do think, you know, aspects of AI right now is embedded on default in so many systems. You know, today AI is embedded in most of your recommendation engines. Anomaly detection is, you know, AI based. You know, the Amazon cameras, the ring cameras, which does parcel detection, people detection and pet detection, you know, is AI based. Mm -hmm. Your smart speaker, you know, NLP, natural language processing, which distinguishes, you know, how you speak, you know, the difference between a dog and a hot dog yeah. uh, is well understood. So AI is getting into the fabric of the world. Yeah. There will be attacks, there will be issues, but then if you look at humanity, we know how to correct it, you know? And, and I just want to highlight this, right? One of my famous, uh, you know, one of my favorite uh, philosophers is a guy called Robert Audrey. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I just want to quote him, you know, just the really? last three sentences of Robert Audrey. He says, uh, shouldn't we appreciate our symphonies however seldom they are played? Mm. Shouldn't we enjoy our peaceful acres, however often they are turned into battlefields? Shouldn't we appreciate our dreams, however rarely they are accomplished? The miracles of man is not how much he has fallen, but how magnificently he has risen. We will be remembered, you know, uh, by our poems and not corpses and our failures. So there will be failures, but look at mankind. We have built all of this. Yep. in spite of all the failures. So I'm an optimist, mate. And I really think, you know, from organic to bionic, we have started the journey. Only time will tell about the pace at which, you know, we traverse through that portal. Sure, sure, excellent. Um, you know, Shree, it's been, it's been really enlightening um, you taking us for this walk through uh, the area of the internet and mobile and now to sort of the, uh, the enchanted edge of things, uh, a really fascinating, career that you've had so far, a fascinating future that you uh, are envisioning for all of us. And um, I just you know, want to really thank you for taking the time out to, to come and, and, and share your vision with us. Um, for everybody that is going to be watching on the YouTube channel or listening on the various podcast networks, we've been uh, speaking with the amazing Sridhar Salur, uh, entrepreneur, technologist, business leader uh, with experience in corporate venturing, strategy, product development across robotics, Internet of Things, mobile tech, artificial intelligence, deep learning, blockchain. I, I could go on for a long time. Sri, it was really an honor having you. Uh, 
and as we say, thank you, uh, thank you for coming on the show, but thank you for, as, as the idea of me mantra is, for moving the human story forward uh, throughout your career and continuing to do so. So a really a pleasure meeting you and having you on the show.